Hello, this is Dr. Ford Brewer with PrevMed, Heart Attack, Stroke, Cancer, Disability Prevention. <clears throat> Today's um, video is on a book called Always Hungry, which describes me until I went on a low-carb diet. It's written by a pediatric endocrinologist at Harvard. His name is David Ludwig. Now that may sound familiar, a book on um, hormonal uh, obesity by a pediatric endocrinologist who runs an obesity center in an academic program with a similar last name. So let's not confuse him with Dr. Robert Lustig, a UCSF pediatric endocrinologist, runs a, uh, an obesity program and wrote a book about sugar and processed foods and obesity. This is not one on fat chance. This is one on always hungry. It's a great book. The first half, I thought I would breeze through given what I've, given my background in uh, obesity and diet. Um, I didn't. I kept getting hung up because it was so good. He, he has created a lot of the recent uh, research, as in over the past five, 10, 15 years in this area. So he's a very active researcher and very, very uh, clear on, um, on his writing style in terms of the science. The second half of the book wasn't quite so good, but we'll get to that a little bit later. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the hormonal obesity uh, theory. And that's what both of these docs are talking about. Basically, what they're saying is carbohydrates increase insulin, and insulin shuts off fat metabolism, grows the fat cells, creates obesity, and then obesity creates all the bad things we know that it creates. Heart attacks, strokes, again, 70% of the risk on a population basis for heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, um, all these bad things that are happening to us. But let's go back and think about it just a minute and look at some other data before we decide it's just insulin. It's not. There are other hormones. For example, ghrelin is the hunger hormone. It's made by the lining of the stomach. And here are, is, a, is a graph showing blood uh, ghrelin levels after a glucose challenge and blood ghrelin levels after a protein meal challenge. So you see they're both similar at hours zero, one, and two. They start off at baseline, then they drop. After the uh, glucose or carbohydrate meal challenge, you get a spike at hours three, four, and five of ghrelin, the hunger hormone. Maybe that starts to explain why you're always hungry if you're eating a lot of carbs. Protein and fat, you don't get that spike at hours three, three, four, and five. So it's, is it really ghrelin instead of insulin? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think there are other hormones involved with this as well. And again, you'll continue to hear um, about multiple endocrine areas, multiple hormones. So look at this. <clears throat> this is cortisol, an adrenal hormone. DHEA, another adrenal hormone. Again, same thing. After a uh, glucose challenge, you get hours three, four, and five, the adrenal hormones both start spiking. Whereas with the protein challenge, they remain low. So... <clears throat> As we get a little bit uh, deeper into the hormones, we begin to see that maybe uh, not so clear and simple just insulin. In fact, insulin, this is the insulin uh, reaction to glucose challenge. It goes higher than it does with um, a protein challenge, but you still see some, some increase with protein. And with glucose itself, you see a major swing starting off really high and then bottoming out. Whereas with proteins, 
a protein challenge, you see the insulin stays, I mean the glucose number stays very stable. So again, <clears throat> this hormonal theory of obesity is something that Dr. Ludwig goes deep into. I'll actually not have nearly enough time to cover that. There are several other topics, for example, leptin, which I won't be able to cover today, um, but <clears throat> I'll cover in future videos. So this is perhaps a more accurate description of the hormonal theory. High insulin, cortisol, DHEA, ghrelin, so the adrenal uh, hormones, insulin, the hunger hormone, all uh, increase. That causes obesity, and then obesity causes the health problems that we know about. Now, just a quick warning. I'm going to show a, uh, a picture that if you're an animal uh, rights activist or lover, basically there's an animal that's been dissected here. Two of them, in fact. Here's the issue. Uh, we're looking at glycemic index. It's one of the uh, studies about does glycemic index really create obesity? And one of the things they did was look at um, feed, feed one set of lab animals a uh, high glycemic diet, another one a low glycemic diet. Guess which is which? This is fat here, and this is actually not fat. So uh, eating a high glycemic diet will definitely cause fat um, development in an animal. Those two animals, by the way, weighed the same. One just had tons of fat, the other one did not. Um, and that's from high glycemic index diet. Uh, if you want to translate that to humans, I've done a video recently on uh, sodas, uh, cola, carbonated sugar water, I don't know that there's anything in our diet that's got a higher glycemic index than that. So if you want to, if you want to start looking like that with that kind of obesity, if that's what you want your body to do, then load up with that sugary big gulp at 7-Eleven or the Coke at McDonald's. Let's get back to the the uh, book. So if you look at the reviews, they were good but just not out of the park and I would agree so for example with uh, Goodreads 3.8 with other ones you'd see about 70 to 80 85 percent uh, positive ratings now why was that <clears throat> a lot of it had to do with part two of the book part two is sort of the how-to uh, but he gets really detailed so if I if after reading the first part of the book I was expecting to have some fairly uh, clear but high-level recipes, thoughts about how to select foods at a restaurant, tips on food selections, uh, maybe some buying guides or whatever. He starts with, first of all, how to clean out your kitchen and goes into depth on that. Then he next goes into what utensils to buy for the kitchen. And then his recipes are just as detailed. So he gets dinged quite a bit for people who are saying, look, I don't want to become a professional chef. I just want to make healthy food for me and my family. And I just want to learn how to select healthy food for me and my family. So it's a great book. I would buy it again, and I'd recommend it without exception for the, uh, for the first half of the book. It's a fantastic review of the science of obesity. Thank you.